faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Moon here, and welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. This week, we have Dan John. Now, Dan John, legendary strength and conditioning coach. Uh, He's just so impressive uh, in the world of lifting and throwing, um, and then also in academia. He's very impressive man. Uh, And to be honest, when I get into, when I have this type or caliber of human being on the Better Humanology podcast, uh, and we kind of discussed this at the end, it would be simple for me to just talk to him about the the best programming methodology and things like that. And we, and we talk about some of those things, hit on them, but I'm more about pulling out the type of person they are, the principles they live by as a coach, as a human being, as a father. And Dan John, to be honest, uh, is a very very impressive human being and my notebook right now is chock full of one-liners tips uh, tricks ideas principles themes uh, that he just laid out in this podcast and I had an amazing time talking to him I know you guys are going to absolutely enjoy listening to this and I know I challenge you to do this a lot to sit down with a pen and paper. And I'm not just saying that to try and, you know, get you amped up for the podcast episode or anything. I really feel like I know, you know, I'm, I'm the, the king of multitasking when it comes to listening to uh, audiobooks while doing the dishes uh, at 2x speed or podcasts. And you might be doing the same thing. You might be uh, driving down the road right now and listening to this podcast, which is fine. Listen to it, but I would, I would challenge you to come back to it. Uh, and, and that's one thing that, you know, I listen to a lot of information. I'm always processing it. Uh, but if you only ever just hear it and you're never taking any action on it, uh, what are you really doing? Uh, like why you're, you're almost processing all this information for vanity's sake. Uh, you're not taking any action. You're not doing anything. Having said all that, I challenge you on this episode to sit down with a pen and piece of paper or note it. However you like to note things. Some of the things that he talks about. I mean, just some of these quotes alone, you could live your life by it. It's really impressive stuff. So I won't uh, ramble on any further. Here is Dan John. All right, Dan, welcome to the Better Humanology podcast, man. I'm really glad you're here today. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, This worked out uh, really easily. Thank you. Yeah. So let's get started with some challenges for the listeners, if you don't mind. And I'm going to throw those to you. So how about a fitness challenge for everyone listening today? Sure. The, the most basic one I know. I want you to floss your t- teeth once or twice a day, preferably twice. For your heart health, statistically, there's probably no more important thing you do. And every single listener knows they're supposed to. And they're going to want to hear about run a marathon, do a triathlon, 10,000 burpees, but yet Honestly, if you can't floss your teeth twice a day, let's not talk about all the other nonsense. There's a challenge for you, and it's easy for me the way I do it. I keep floss sticks in the little well on the driver's side of my cars. So I floss when I do my errands that's or awesome. drop my wife off. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving how this you, podcast is getting started already. That's that's hey, great. It, and, it's, and it's bigger than you think. It is bigger than you think. And it's so simple, but people want to talk to me about snatches and clean and jerks and uh, micro periodization on, and it's like, do you flush, do you floss your teeth? Uh, no. Okay. Before you take on this Herculean effort, let's floss your teeth. Well, that's easy. Yeah, of course it's easy. Everything's easy. Everything's <laughs> simple. <laughs> that's, that's great, man. I really love that one. All right. So, uh, I, that, that, that's all. That's awesome. I'm, I'm actually really, uh, impressed with that one for multiple reasons the, the discipline it takes like you said the studies that, that correlate to, to heart yeah. disease and everything it's just it's a, such an amazing um amazing challenge for everyone listening that's great that's yeah, absolutely yeah yeah all right so uh how about a mental toughness challenge how about this there's a there's a great show called guys and dolls 
And in the in the show and the movie, it really you notice it more in the movie, is they don't contract uh, can't, it's cannot, and don't, it's do not. And one of my concerns is, you know, the old joke is uh, you ignore everything before the word but. Have you ever heard that before? I have. Uh, hey, you're a good looking guy, but, you know, ignore you're a good looking guy because the but is the real point. Oh, that's good. The but's the point of that story. Uh, they argue that uh, whether you say can or can't, the brain hears it the same way. So one little mental challenge, it's a fun one, is for a day, a week, an hour don't contract make the conscious effort like if i say can you squat you would reply either yes i can or no i cannot and by saying not you force yourself to not just throw the word back at my face uh it's a little it's a weird mental challenge but i'll tell you one thing if if you're like me you know, I knock out two or three books a year and I travel 260,000 miles this year. And I do all these things because I try to say yes to life. That's one of my big things. And what I've discovered is uh, just something as simple as saying I can't, I don't, I won't really gets in the way of success. I know, it again, it's like flossing your teeth. It's very small, but try it. And and. The, the, the act of will that it takes to say, I cannot squat, will almost make you go, yeah, let's at least try it, okay? <laughs> there you go. A silly one, but it's a good one. I think that's a great one, uh, just like the flossing, because you know as, a, as an author and then just communicator in general as a coach, you know, you have to be very clear about what you're stating. And I think that it does carry a lot more, just hearing you say it, just a lot more weight uh, for someone to say, ah, I can't do that. Or I cannot do that. You know, that's, it's just totally, yes. totally a different approach. Yeah. And, and, and you got to say yes to life. You do. It, it, all the great adventures my wife and I have, it's because we just say yes. In the last two weeks, we've had friends from uh, Belfast, friends from, uh, uh, Denmark, uh, friends from uh, different parts of the United States stay with us and train with us. And because my wife says, yes, sure, of course, house is open. Come on in, you know, and uh, and what that does is it just expands our life. Uh, we met Niall up in Belfast. He says, you know, my mom's got a place in County Sligo. Do you want to visit? Yes. And before you know it, Niall and I become best friends and we hang out together in some of the most beautiful places in the world. One of the most beautiful places in the world. So, okay, there we go. Enough of that. No, say say yes to life. I love that. And you've are you talking about when opportunities present themselves primarily, try and be a little bit more open minded and give it a try. Say yes as opposed to just always, you know, brushing things off to no or I don't have the time or I'm too busy or all you know, all the things that we can come up with as excuses in life. Well, frankly, Jared, I mean, if you just say yes or no, uh, the worst, uh, there's nothing worse than uh, not making a decision because life will make your decisions for you. Uh, and that's one thing I've been very lucky in my life is that I was able to say, I want to go to Utah State University. So when I was going through college and, and even junior college, in the back of my mind, Utah State was my yes school. So when Coach Mon called me, yes. That's my yes. And I didn't have to worry anymore from there. Um, <laughs> Tiff and I started talking about getting married two weeks after I met her. She was my yes girl. Okay. Um, different way to look at the world. I know that, but it works for me. <laughs> hey, I like it. All right. How about a, a book recommendation? The Sword and the Stone. T.H. Uh, White's 1938 classic uh, was rewritten in 1958. I think it's uh, in fear. Uh, in 1970, I went to the, uh, a thing that was scarce for readers. It's called a library and it's filled with something called books and it's going <laughs> to scare some people. And it's funny cause I have this slide in my presentation. There's three books in, uh, Miles Calm's book, bodybuilding and self-defense. The first weightlifting book I ever actually read, uh, the sword and the stone by TH white, the book that made me a voracious reader and the book by, uh, Elliot Asanoff. Uh, seven days to Sunday, 
where I met Kenny Avery on the Wednesday. And Kenny Avery was my hero. He was a linebacker for <clears throat> first the Giants, uh, then the Bengals, and finally retired to the Chiefs. He was undersized, and I and I just I followed his little gosh, fifteen paragraph story, and I use it as a template for my life. He threw the discus, I threw the discus. You know, he worked harder than everybody else. I worked harder than everybody else. But I would say the sword and the stone. Uh, for your readers who don't know my work. I have a weekly newsletter called Wandering Weights, and I have a section there every week where I'm going paragraph by paragraph through the sword and stone uh, as a 60-year-old. And it's kind of fascinating to uh, – the book is a, a love affair with education, but it's also for him to pull the sword out of the stone, he needs uh, – <laughs> it's the best strength training advice I'd ever read in my life. <laughs> uh, so – yeah, those that, that's my that's my book recommendation. Very very interesting. Uh, I'm gonna have to. I I haven't read it. I, I'm familiar with the story, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to to read yeah. the book. That's fabulous. Yeah, the best. Yeah. Uh, you said best strength training advice you could. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if you just give me a second, I can. Uh, I, do you do you want to hear it? I, mean, I would do you love go to. Through? Yeah. Uh, okay. Give me just a second. Let me just. Pull up. I don't want to misquote, uh, you know, my hero. So, uh, okay. So the line is something like this. The wart walked up to the great sword for the third time. He put out his right hand softly and drew it out as gently as from a scabbard. Well, the advice he had gotten from his friends is, you have to read the book, but his animal friends, uh, the, uh, the loose, who's a pike, a big freshwater mean fish, Power springs from the nape of the neck. The badger told him, use those forearms held together by the chest. Um, the, the trees taught him, find your tool. Well, actually, well, don't worry about that. Uh, never let go was, of course, the, uh, the, the term of the hawks. Keep up a steady effort, which was given the advice given to him by the, the, uh, the, his friend, the owl. And fold your powers together with the spirit of your mind, which is uh, b b depends on where it is. In one book, it comes from the snake and the other version from the geese. But uh, the book is about getting yourself up, to <laughs> you, getting strong enough to pull the sword from the stone. And that's my dog barking at the new man, Adam. OK, <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I love that. And uh, I think that's a great book recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so if you don't mind, you've had um, you know a, a very awesome career, for lack of a better word, and, and you know you're very well accomplished. It, but if if you don't mind sharing with everyone listening today, maybe someone who doesn't know who you are or not familiar with your work, if you could provide us with some some background and and who you are and, and what you do. Well, sure. Uh, well, uh, what I do right now is I, as I write two or three. Uh, uh, two or three books a year on strength training. I have a really odd career. I'm a, uh, I'm a senior lecturer at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, London, in strength and condi in conditioning. But I'm also an instructor at Columbia College of Missouri in religious studies. So those are the two, those are my two feet, uh, religious studies and uh, strength and conditioning. Uh, I started coaching in 1979. Uh, I continue to this day. Um, I was a. I played American football, which I thought I would go on to college, but it turned out I, was, I went on to college and I was a, a discus thrower. I was a track and field MVP for Utah State my senior year, um, state champion in California, uh, Highland Games, uh, weight pentathlon, uh, Olympic lifting. Uh, I've done every strength sport uh, at some level, very high levels in some cases. I don't know if you're your people would under, would know the numbers, but, uh, um, my, my lifts and throws are pretty, they're pretty good numbers, you know, international standard in the throws, um, had a fun career. Uh, uh, just three weeks ago, I Olympic lifted at our state record makers meet and broke three state records, you know? And so I still lift, uh, I try to compete in the Highland games as often as I can, though now with my travel schedule, it gets tough. Uh, I'm down to about one or two a year. I was, I've done as many as 14 or 15 in a year. Wow. Uh, 
And so uh, I compete a lot. I travel a lot. Uh, I laugh a lot. I, I have I'm, my wife is a federal bank examiner. I have two daughters who are it's kind of cool. They're 25 and 27, graduated from college debt free and both own their own homes now, which is pretty good. And, and then I also have two grandchildren from my older daughter, Kelly, a little Danny and Josephine. So I'm a grandfather. I'm a father. I'm a community member. and Life's pretty good. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, a lot to be proud of. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so what you said you're writing about uh, two to three books a year. Yeah. Um, why? why that, I mean, that's pretty ambitious. Uh, I've only ever written one book that uh, published book. Uh, and I, I do write a lot, though, um, consider myself a writer and author. But that, that's pretty ambitious amount of writing. Why? Why so aggressive in the two, three books per year? It just works out too. I mean, I have two publishers, so that, that works out nicely. And, um, you know, uh, throwers throw lifters lift writers, write. You know, right. <laughs> uh, I get up every day about five thirty, six o'clock and, uh, the coffee, I've already made the coffee from the night before. And I sit down and you'll notice I answer every email. Uh, I deal with all that stuff first. And then I do my Columbia college work, uh, the religious studies class, uh, if I have any articles I need to write, I write them. Um, and it, it's just not that big a deal to me. It's what I do. And then at 9 o'clock, I get ready because at 9.30, people from all the world show up to work out with me in my gym. And we train for an hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes, hour and 10 minutes. And then we go eat breakfast. And then after breakfast, I tend to do podcasts and errands, you know, house errands and things like that, which are always a good time. And, uh, and then the afternoons, uh, I try to devote my afternoons. Well, I mean, to cooking dinner, which I've already got on um, tonight's, uh, jambalaya and I've already got the, the first part done. I won't have to do anything until about five or six now. Um, I, I hang out with my dog and take him for a walk. He's barking now, <laughs> uh, cause the mailman is still coming. Um, and I spend the afternoon sometimes really just prepping myself to, uh, to write. I read. Uh, which if you're not reading, you're not writing. Um, uh, I talk a lot in conversations. I call people, we talk about lifting. Uh, that's when I do my consulting and things like that. But I find that, that everything just kind of winds together. If, if I, if the more proactive I am before I go to bed, the more writing I get done the next day. And so, what do you, what are you reading primarily? Uh, do you read a lot of primarily studies or are you into? Oh God, no, they're perfect. They're worthless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think I read a study in years that made me go, huh? That was, well, yeah, I mean, they just, these studies where they have six freshman kids and they find out they get stronger by lifting weights. I don't think we need to do that. No, I, I, I am well versed in the classics. Um, I have book, I have bookshelves throughout the house. I'll tell you in a minute what I'm doing right now, but, uh, like if I, if I just turn around right now, I see um, well, the Sword of the Stone, uh, Gilgamesh, The Art of War, Hemingway, J.K. Rowling's Fantastical Beasts, uh, a very interesting book book called An Ex- Exaltation of Larks. Uh, and then there's some other. I mean, then there's weightlifting books. I'm, I just finished Tom Brady's new book, uh, John Bruner's new book on Neuro Grip Challenge, uh, a book on success. There's Tommy Kono's book there. So I do read a lot in the field, but one thing I also try to do is I try to find an area I'm weak in and expand on it. And this will sound maybe odd to many of your listeners, but I grew up in the great books uh, tradition. So when I was in school, we didn't read kids' books. We only read, uh, well, I mean, Robinson, you know, Robinson Crusoe is kind of a kid's book, Treasure Island, you know, those kinds of books. So as an adult, I, I decided I have a lot of young godchildren and teenage friends who are reading books. So, you know, obviously I loved it. I love the entire Harry Potter series. And uh, one of my godchildren, Chloe, said to me, well, have you ever read Percy Jackson? So I finished the five basic Percy Jackson books. Then I just finished this, the Jason, uh, the Jason, the Greek hero stories. But while I was in the middle of it, the art of manliness had a very interesting thing. And this just stick with me here because I think it's funny about how everything you need to know about life you could learn from the Hardy Boys. So I <laughs> went to my little, I went to the little bookstore near my house, which uh, it's just a private, uh, independent bookstore. 
uh, which is funny because they also carry my books, which cracks me up because I'll come in and uh, the nice lady will say, oh, it's one of the authors. And she'll make a nice little bit. I don't know if it's ever sold a book, but it makes me happy. <laughs> so uh, I'm reading the Hardy Boys books. And uh, The Art of Manliness has this great article, well worth your time. Yeah, I wouldn't mind if you could, if you could link it. The Art of Manliness and then the, the Hardy Boys. It's a very good article. And so it got me reading the Hardy Boys. And here I am, the 60-year-old man. I've never read them. Um, the stories, it's funny. I told my, my, my wife, said, what are they like? I go, well, they're kind of like Dan Brown books, except they're good. Uh, you, know, the, you know how Dan, how do you know something's going to happen in a Dan Brown book? Is it's the end of the chapter, you know? And they're very much like that, but they're a delightful, fun read. I know. So what I'm, I guess uh, right now I'm, for fun, reading some children's books. Uh, but also trying to keep up with the various good strength books that have been coming out. And we've had a good couple of years, I think, uh, in the, in the strength field. And, uh, I also, you know, if you read my wandering weights, you can see that I, I do have an eclectic uh, reading list, uh, online. Uh, I really, uh, I read a phenomenal article the other day on curbs, you know, street curbs. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what a political, ping pong ball those things are and how how they really define what's happening to a city the curbs the curb <laughs> uh, it was so i like that kind of thing i like when something blows my mind to go back to the 1960s that makes me really go huh i had no idea you know i think that's very fascinating i, I really like uh what you're reading you know to be honest that's what i was i was asking if you uh, you know, we're diving into studies all the time and, you know, strength and conditioning books. But I, I love that you are very, uh, you know, well-rounded in your reading and you like sure. to really like uh, expand. I think that's that's awesome. Well, go back through all the strength books and, and find something on farmer walks or loaded carries. Nothing. They're still arguing about one set versus three sets, which frankly was was answered by DeLorme and Watkins in 1951. Yeah, it's three sets. But it could be five. It could be one. Everything works for a couple of weeks. And so I just get so tired. Of reading. I just feel like, uh, you know, I have all the strength and health magazines. Oh, back until about probably the mid 50s. So from the mid 50s to about, I think it's 1985. And whenever somebody tells me they invented something, I just go back there and I find it. I go back to John Jesse's book, uh, The Wrestling Conditioning Encyclopedia. And everything that's been invented in the last decade is there. Decade, last two decades. Uh, there's nothing there are, we have gotten better. I think we, we, we now really look at movement better than we did say 20, 15 years ago. So we are, we are taking these exercises and then moving them into more appropriate for the older, the senior audience, which I guess I am now. But the problem is at the same time, the exercise Nazis have showed up that if you do this in this movement, you will die. And it's like, okay, stop. So that's the issue in the field I'm in is that we tend to swing wildly back and forth. You know, you got to make people puke. You should never hurt anybody. And we just swing wildly back and forth like a pendulum. So it's very difficult for me to read anything in the field uh, unless it's a book. Now, I like books in the field. Stu McGill's new book, The Gift of Injury, I think is brilliant. I mean, I just think that book is brilliant. I really liked uh, Tom Brady's uh, TV 12 book, but I guess I'm supposed to hate it from what I let, read on Facebook. Uh, that's kind of a joke. <laughs> uh, you know, it, I, I think we're in a real wonderful time in our industry with, with books. And I apologize for him. He just gets fired up when someone walks. And it's the mailman who parked out there for 20 minutes. But uh, I, I, think, I think we're in a real good time. Uh, certain authors who would have never, I mean, Stu McGill's books, forget, I'm just picking him up. Uh, his work is so clear and clean, but you know, who would have, I'm not sure people would have published him 40 years ago, you know, and myself, I don't think I got published. And it's very happy that for me, that all these smaller places and self publishing have showed up in our field, because I think that's actually better than having those New York city office mills, knocking out a book on strength. I mean, you look at some of the nonsense that comes out in those big corporations. It's just like, did you just cut and paste this last stupid thing you said? <laughs> you know, and it's what I find fascinating too, is a, I had a guy from one of the companies says, 
well, if we have to do a book, we'll need references. I go, uh, references like at the end, scientific references. Oh, yeah, it's very important that everything we have in the books is, you know, we give the original source. So I pulled out one of his books that you can buy at Barnes & Noble. And I said, you see this exercise here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I invented that. I don't see my name on it. You see this exercise here? Yeah, I invented that. You see the way this workout program here is on this book you have? Yeah, that's all out of my book, Intervention. And he went, oh, I go, yeah, you reference scientific stuff, but but when you steal, you guys steal. Now, I have to be careful because I'm a master thief. See, that's the difference between me, me and those guys. Those guys are just simple they're, 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 they're guys who come up to your door with a, with a, with an ax and knock the door down. I'm a master thief. Okay. Uh, that's a joke. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm... Cause, cause we're all terrible thieves in this industry. I tell you, but, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, no, that, that, that's great. So uh, what are you, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, we all, I mean, we all learn and, and learn from each other and from books and from experience and from other people. And so it's almost like nothing is truly ever, uh, your own, it feels like, you know. Yeah, uh, Lyle McDonald and I uh, were, ta- were talking last night. Do you know who Lyle McDonald is? I don't. Okay, he is one of the prop- He's probably my favorite nutritionist because his rigor is so high. He won't, I don't, I'm not sure he can write the word the without ensuring that that's the right word. He's wonderful. And we were laughing about how I refuse to look at research, and he only looks at research. Everything I do is experiential, empirical. Everything he does is research-based, and we come to the exact same conclusions on exercise, diet, training, and everything else. And I thought it was funny because as a, as a coach you know, in track and field, football, weightlifting, I don't have time for the study to come out. My athletes don't have time for the – for the printing of this study for, you know, to, to be collated into where, Hey, our championships next Saturday, we don't have time for research. We, like I said, joke, the, one of the great, if you ever want to become a great coach, coach American football, because you have 25 seconds at the high school level to get the play in 25 seconds. The next time you have 25 seconds, look at 25 seconds and you have to make a decision that involves 11 people, 11 opponents, seven officials, uh, sidelines things, down, distance, everything, injuries uh, in 25 seconds. And it's wonderful because it teaches you the skill set of making decisions and, 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 and really appreciating the process for the decision. We made this, we decided that when this situation came up, we would do this, now do it. Because we don't have time to second guess what we thought of three weeks ago or two weeks ago or the other day. So, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big believer that I just don't have time with my, when you work with a high school senior, for example, it, the, the, the sun is setting. You don't have time to, to, to find something better. The, the kid's only got a few months. You know, every senior football player in America almost has just ended their football season and they'll never play again. They're done, you know, so you can't you, you just don't have time for research. If that if that makes sense to you in the performance world. No, I think that makes perfect sense. I Because uh, what you mentioned uh, going back a little bit, you're like, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if uh, they, they tested nine freshmen and they all got stronger or whatever. I, I think that those studies come up a lot where you, ha- you really have to pay attention to the not not only what they're doing, but the the populace, and and most of these studies are just getting published because uh, some you know PhD candidate needs <laughs> needs a study to be published in order for them to finish and get their degree and you know get a pat on the back or whatever. Um, and most of the time, they aren't really relevant. I think if you're coaching and you have a base of athletes, you have to be way more dynamic in nature. You have to make, like you said, quicker decisions. You have to rely a lot more on your experience and. The actual app, like that's your populace. I mean, you can you can translate your information to, uh, you know, greater people in the society, but uh, it might not work out the same. But I think that that's a, a much better indicator than uh, some random, yeah, like you said, five or six person study on strength training. Well, and it's interesting because okay, so on my on my website I have a, new, a newsletter called Get Up, and it's free. And go in and 
I mean, it's gonna if you print them off, it's gonna cost you two reams of paper. So just read them first. Um, and we had an Olympic gold medalist who wanted to share his training program with people. No one would publish it. So we published it. And it's like, my thought was, wait, no one wants the Olympic gold medalist training program because he didn't have it refereed and he didn't have citations. He just said, I, here are the 12 things I did. I, I thought it was brilliant. And that's part of the problem we have. And well, any field, and and I guess part of it, you're, you're, you're circling around it, is the way we do things here in the United States is much of our secondary, or maybe tertiary development of athletes is collegiate and university level. We don't have a solid club system. We don't have a semi-pro system in too many sports. And the sports we do have semi-pro, uh, really, they're just feeders to the pros. They're not really entities to themselves. So what happens is because they're because the sports are locked into the college, there's that collegial mindset of publish or perish. And sometimes things that work well aren't really – they're not really – should belong to the Utah Strength Conditioning Quarterly. They're just a good idea that works if you follow. Oh, yeah. 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 So that well, like, for example – when I started doing loaded carries because I broke my wrist and I couldn't really do anything else, it transformed my career. So the research behind it was this, break your wrist into eight pieces, be told by your doctor, you'll never lift weights again. Look at your doctor in the eye and say, you don't know who you're talking to. Go home, start, pick up heavy bags with a sled and go for a walk. A couple months later, you throw the discus as far as you ever have in your life because you pick up bags and carry them. Um, I'm not sure that's the most scientific way of doing stuff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but it worked. It worked. And I think, uh, I haven't read the book yet, but it, it, your, your story there reminds me of the book title. You just said the, I, what was it called? The gift of injury, the gift of injury. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know what? You're, you're, well, <laughs> my wife and I talk about it a lot about, it's something I first picked up at the Olympic training center. I think Lindsay wasn't born yet, so it had to have been when I was there in '91. So I had a one year, uh, I had a one year old and a pregnant wife, and they asked us to do this very interesting thing. We write down the ten best things that ever happened in your career, and then the hard one: what are the ten worst? Man, that, that was tough to do. I didn't like it. And then the the sports psych guy says, "Now look at your worst list, and man, that you don't want to. Then look at your best." And it's funny because. Every great moment in your career, the, the seed is from the worst moment in your career. It's like the prophet Gahil Gibran wrote. Gahil Gibran wrote in the prophet, uh, at your happiest moments, look inside your heart, and you will find the seeds of your saddest. And at your saddest moments, look inside your heart, and you'll find the seeds of your happiest moments. And, um, and I think great things happen in careers – uh, the other great thing was when the best gym I ever trained at closed down overnight. Uh, we had seven Olympic lifting platforms. We had a sprinting area. We had a, I mean, just everything, boxes, everything you can imagine. It was phenomenal. And then Monday I went and closed. And I thought, oh, for the day? No, gone. And so I had 165 pounds total of weight trying to prepare myself for the Olympic trials. And so I had to on a dime, change the way I train. And it worked out better than I ever thought. So, yes. So, yes, inside the seeds, inside the ruins is usually success. Um, and that's why, that's why I've never really said that something's good or bad. Uh, do you know the story about the farmer and his son? It's, it's a cliche, but I'll, do, do you know it? I'm not sure if I do or not. I try okay. it out, yeah. All right. A farmer had a son. And a horse. And one day the horse died. And all the farm, all the area people said, oh, what a sad thing this is. And the farmer said, we'll see. Well, the next day, all the other neighbors got together and bought him a new horse. And all the neighbors said, what a good thing. And the farmer said, we'll see. The next day, the son jumped up on the horse and tried to break it, you know, 
And the horse kicked him off, and the boy broke his leg. And all the neighbors came by and said, what a sad thing that is. And the farmer said, we'll see. The next day, the army came to town, took all the young men in the town, and marched them off to war, and where they all died. And the neighbors came around and said, isn't it a good thing your son broke his leg so he couldn't go off to war? And the farmer says, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I use the we'll see story all the time. You know, when someone tells me, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me, I'm always like, wait, you're a junior in high school, and <laughs> this is the worst thing that's ever going to happen. Son, you're going to, or daughter, you're going to have a great life, man. You are going to have a blessed life because if that's the worst thing that ever happened to you, by gosh, I'm glad there's no miscarriages in your future, no divorce, no tragic auto accidents, no, no debilitating cancers because getting stood up for the dance is the worst thing that'll ever happen to you. You're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. And so go, going back to your, you know, coming up in your career, because now I'm kind of curious as to, you know, coaching and, and writing books. Um, did you have mentors as you were coming up in the in the coaching world, you know, just first getting started uh, up to now? Um, did do you primarily gather your your experience and what you write about all through um, your own experience in coaching? Um, discuss it, discussions with other high level coaches and uh thought leaders in the industry how do you go about sharpening the the axe if you will oh i mean yeah i've had the best i mean huh, you know i mean i'd hate to leave out anybody but it goes back to my brothers who are all division one athletes and then of course i would have to, let's 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 bring up two two big time ones there's more but uh it would ho of course be dick notmeyer who i still talk to um I love him. He's uh, 86 years old. Still, he, he told me last time some bad news. He can either lift or ride his bike every day. He can no longer do both, <laughs> which, you know, which is pretty impressive for someone that age. But I met Dick literally uh, when he was coming out of the bathroom at a weightlifting meet. And uh, he invited me up to his gym. And five days a week, I Olympic lifted for about three hours a day. And he charged, a, he charged a quarter, a quarter, 25 cents a week for 15 hours, 16 hours of training a week. Nice. And uh, when I first met him, I weighed 162. Four months later, I weighed 202, all traps and thighs and lower back. <laughs> and uh, I went from being a good high school thrower to being a, a Division One athlete. Uh, he changed my life in so many different ways. Uh, when something bad would happen, and something bad always happens, he would sit down and tell a story and his, uh, his method of coaching was always, you know, you can overcome just about anything. If you just, if you just stick with it, just stay with it, you know, front squats and protein, man, that's the answer to all life's problems. Well, and then I went off to Utah state. Now, when I was a, a ninth grade discus thrower, I was through 103, which is, you know, which is fine for a ninth grader. But uh, my brother Richard brought me down to Track and Field News, and I bought a book called the Track and Field Omni Book. And in it, it talked about Ralph Maughan at Utah State University. And I told my sister, I said, you know, I want to go to Utah State University and throw the discus for Ralph Maughan. Well, I figured, well, there's no way he'd be around. Well, my sophomore year in college, I get a phone call one night, and it is, hello, I'm Ralph Maughan from Utah State University, and I'd like to offer you a full-ride scholarship to come and throw for us. And it took six years to get there. I had to go to junior college. But uh, so always be careful what you set your goals on. But when I met Coach Mon, I'd never met somebody who could simplify the path to success any better in my life. He told me on day one, if you lift weights three days a week and you throw the discus four days a week for eight years, you'll be great. And I wish I'd have followed that simple. I mean, I made it way too complicated. But he was just a real simple guy who loved to keep things. I hate to use, keep using the word simple, but simple. You know, he just understood the value in keeping things. 
keeping the process clear and simple. And his big thing was little and often over the long haul. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to make huge changes in a day, but in eight years, all those days are going to combine to be just an amazing thing. Little and often over the long haul. I love that. Yeah, it's the answer to all questions in life. Uh, if you want to retire like I did at 50, what is it, 52 when I retired? What, you, know, what, you want to know my secret? I saved 10%. Okay. And it, <laughs> who doesn't know that? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't know that? Uh, and you're going you're gonna to have people emailing, what was that thing about 10%? That's fascinating. Yeah, I, yeah, I was able to do it. Um, and uh, I mean, I, if you were, I mean, for me, retired means whatever. I mean, I only work. 364 days a year is what I consider retired. <laughs> um, I take Thanksgiving off, but, uh, but I did work on Thanksgiving just a little bit, but, uh, you know, where, I mean, you want to have a good relationship with your wife, spouse, husband, uh, you know, you don't, it can't be the big stuff, you know, once a year, it's gotta be a little bit every day. You know, if you want good kids, you can't, you can't, Oh, we're going to go to a, counselor and we're gonna have this intervention no it, by the time it's by the time you have an intervention it's too late to have an intervention uh ah, you want a good dog you know uh, it's you take him for a walk every day and you teach him you know, you know come on i mean i set the jambalaya in there uh, but uh 11 o'clock that's tonight's dinner's jambalaya at 11 o'clock in the slow cooker and people ask me what's the secret to good jambalaya good spaghetti good steak well it's the preparation it's the time you know, it's the, you know, I, when I cook steak, I brine it and let it sit for anywhere from 12 hours to 36, you know, and I let jambalaya take, you know, eight, eight hours to, to cook. Oh, there's the, everything's that way in life. I, I think uh, yeah, this flossing your teeth thing to get back to, you know, flossing your teeth one time before you go to the dentist isn't going <laughs> to really make a difference. I mean, it'll make it easier for the, you know, the nice little dental technician to get some of the crap out of your mouth. But other than that, there's no. But if you floss your teeth every day from age 7 to age 70, you're going to be doing okay. you would be doing okay. And so you, you probably have worked with a lot of other coaches, or you know, uh, and I, I know you do as you travel uh, pretty much around the world. What What's something that you, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, – I don't want to put it in a negative context, but how, how, how could how could uh, younger coaches best improve themselves right now in strength and conditioning world? Well, let's let's start with the let's start with a real vague uh, let's start with a real vague uh, you know obvious kind of thing, and then let's build into some thou shalt not. Okay, let's do that. Sound good? That sounds perfect. Okay. So the first thing I, the first thing I, okay, <laughs> I'm right there mentally with the shall not. So let's go with two of them. First, you got to have intellectual humility. Okay. Okay. You've got to be able to say it's, what we did was wrong. You've got to have the ability to say I was wrong. What we agreed to do was wrong. Oh my God, are we on the wrong track now? Let's stop. This isn't working. This is a failure. I've done that twice in my career very clearly. We did CrossFit. We did Nautilus training. Uh, it was real obvious. We were getting injured. We weren't throwing as far. Things were bad. As Carl S uh, Sagan says, you know, science thrives on errors. And I think that, I think that if, you don't, if you don't think you're ever to be wrong, please don't coach. But you have to have intellectual humility first and foremost, okay? And then the second thing, if you don't mind, I don't see this a lot. Uh, it depends on where you've been. But the the word we use in American football is uh, don't scrimmage with your athletes. Uh, don't compete with your athletes. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now let's give you the let's give you the route to being a good coach. One, the fundamentals. The, the, the foundation is to learn the fundamentals of your world, of the world. And the fundamentals of the world of strength and conditioning, which is what I do, uh, the Olympic lifts, the power lifts, uh, tons of different games, 
tons. You should, you've got to know a bunch of different games. You've got to know a bunch of different sports. You got to know calisthenics. You got to know gymnastics. You should know the military sports. You should have some hook on nutrition, some hook on bodybuilding, and some hook on fat loss. Um, and honestly, at this stage in your game, uh, my friend Ole Stugard from uh, Denmark, when he was here and we were talking about it, he when I said basically that to him, he said, oh, yeah, you must learn the how before you learn the why. So you should learn how to Olympic lift, power lift, do calisthenics, do the TRX, uh, do the hip thrust machine. Um, I'm marching around the gym. The uh, Concept 2 rower, the aerodyne, uh, the, 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 ha the hammer on the tire thingy, the farmer walk, the sled pull. You should do all that first. You should learn it all first. Okay, you should eat a bunch of good meals in a row before you start finding perfection. Okay, okay, that's one. And then number two, uh, I always quote Zartoski on this, and I think he's right. Only the general ideas of underlying noteworthy training programs, not the entire protocol, should be understood and creatively employed. Don't worry about that big sentence. Worry about this. Learn the principles next. What, what are the, what are the, the, learn, this is when you'd learn the why. Okay. So what you want to be able to do is look at a, a program. Um, you, you want to go to a workshop and see that this person uh, does three sets of eight to help geriatrics uh, build muscle. Well, if three sets of eight builds muscle and geriatrics, boy, 15 to 25 reps would probably build muscle for a high school athlete, a collegiate athlete, a professional in the offseason. Uh, if loaded carries, if farmer walks miraculously change an athlete's career, we should do some loaded carries. Well, but Dan has those special bars that his friend make. Should we measure those? And No, 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 no. It's not the... It's not the exact bars. It's the idea that he does loaded carries, if you follow, okay? Yeah. Uh, then, and then number three, and this is, what, this is what changes my life. Focus on what works. Don't be afraid to stick with what works. And this is why pe people say, Dan, you're a contrarian. I'll go, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, the one person said, well, your throwers don't do any jogging. They don't do any stretching. They don't do right. My, my throwers throw, they do farmer walks, they do overhead squats, they do discus drills, and they throw more than anybody else. So while your guys are jogging, doing plyometrics and warming up, my throwers have already done 500 turns. You're now, when the track meet happens, we're 500 times more prepared than you are just in the first 20 minutes of practice. So I focus on what works. If you got fat loss, if you're doing fat loss clients, and what you find uh, with Josh uh, Hillis's great insight, by focusing on the food journal, women tend to lose body fat. The more he focuses on what they write down in the food journal, the better success they have in fat loss. So if he marches away from food journals, my job is to slap him across the face and go, why are you walking away from what works? So what you need to do as a coach is start to check mark all those little things that work, what works. And what you'll notice is very quickly is if you just focus on what works, you're probably doing the fundamentals. <laughs> you're probably doing the fundamentals. Now, and then someone's going to raise their hand and go, why do you do that? And my response is because it works. And then they're going to raise their hand. Why does it work? And my response always is because it does. I don't, you know, if I said something up there like, uh, you don't know how to do kettlebells. You don't. Okay, I say kettlebell swing. You don't know what that is. You have to have the intellectual humility of saying, "I don't know the fundamentals of kettlebell or Olympic lifts or powerless or whatever." Uh, the next thing is, people want the why all the time, but really, only the intellectual hum humility side comes in with, with that. Learn the principles because sometimes we don't know why. And of course, number three is people fall in love with what people fall in love with things. And I say you only should fall in love with what works. 
but I think we were talking about the three hundred dollar program or something. Yeah. Like that, right. All right. So it actually kind of brings me. To, I, I feel like um, you, you're talking about people following and falling in love with things and, and never abandoning them. But you said you've done it twice in your career. Um, was it specifically with Nautilus and with CrossFit? Well, those would be the two big ones because I spent two years on each. And what was the – what happened? I, I'm just curious about the uh, – I didn't throw very far. And My throat. <laughs> that, that's a, well, that's, yeah. that, that's the beautiful thing about being a track and field athlete is that there is this line in the sand. You know, either I'm better or not. And uh, with Nautilus, I remember having big pecs and big biceps, but I could barely get out of my own way. <laughs> so <laughs> – so, uh, um, there, oh, there's been some other ones. I mean, I'm sure that somewhere in the world, there's probably about 10,000 pounds of books and pieces of equipment that I've tried to hide and uh, not let people know about. But, uh, yeah. And, and here's the funny thing. Some things that work really, really well, you don't do. Uh, you don't do anymore. For example, uh, in my career, one of the real things that I thought was magnificent was this thing called heavy hands. Leonard Schwartz's idea of walking around with weights in your hands, that really strange style that you're like cross-country ski walking. You look like a lunatic. That's why I stopped doing it. And yet, when I was doing that in the off-season, I looked better, I felt better, my blood profiles were marvelous. I had no injuries in the off-season doing that. But since I looked silly, in fact, Mike today we were doing, it was one of our stations was heavy hands, and Mike said, as long as people don't see me doing it, I'm going to keep doing it. I thought that was hilarious because that just tied in exactly with the problem. <laughs> it worked well, but you look stupid, so we're not doing it. Um, oh, I, I must have bought a million dollars worth of supplements that were all worthless, um, some different pieces of equipment. You know, in my own home gym, you know, I had uh, at one time Nautilus Armor Curl, Nautilus Tricep Extension Machines, oh, various different pieces of equipment that – it's sometimes I'll go around the house and one of our beds didn't uh, start a bowing in the middle. So I put a, a, a squat box there. So, <laughs> so sometimes our, our equipment gets re reused as, you know, <laughs> life items, <laughs> life items. That's kind of funny to think about that. Uh, yeah. Basically though, like I say in my new workshop, you know, you know, the Olympic lifts and the power lifts done well, can do miracles, if appropriate, for the audience you're doing. But that's kind of the hard thing. I mean, if I would start working with you when you were 12, I mean, I would have you do the Olympic lifts and the power lifts. If I start working with you at 60, well, we're going to work with the hinge and the squat movements and find a place for you. Where is a place that we can get you to move safely and appropriately and then slowly build up the volume, reps and sets, and then load? Um, but that's that's 60 year old Dan John who's lifted weights since 1965 and coached in 79's view. It's not the Dan John view from 1980 when the answer to all questions was snatch and clean a jerk, <laughs> you know? So, so, uh, so you have to go with me a little bit on this. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So next I want to ask you what we call the book question. Sure. And so, Say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented and the president calls you up and says you're responsible for one chapter of this new book rolling out nationwide. So every single child in America will have to read your chapter and be tested on and pass before they can graduate high school. Uh, what would your chapter be about? Reasonableness. Okay. Uh, explain that a little bit more. Yeah, being reasonable. Um, you know, um, let me see if I, can, if I can pop up this classic quote real quick. Here, here, it comes down. I have a little quadrant, and it's the quadrant is tough, tough diet, reasonable diet, tough workout, reasonable workout. And most people are convinced that they can do tough workouts and reasonable. Um, yeah, uh, they they think they can do tough workouts and tough diets at the same time. They can be on twelve hundred calories. OK, and also train, you know, for the for the a marathon, a triathlon and every other thon you can think of. OK, and it's just not true. And so uh, I do think there are times that you can 
have a re okay well let's go to reasonable and reasonable for me a reasonable eating program would be something like the mediterranean diet i hate to call it a diet but you know eat lots of vegetables have your olive oil eat fish eat chicken eat meat in reasonable qualities live life enjoy people a uh, reasonable training program is probably what we do uh you know you show up every day you do the fundamental human movements you you then you do a little bit of 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and then we go have breakfast, okay? There are times you can do tough programs and reasonable eating, like when you're getting ready for something, like you're prepping for the nationals or something like that. And I would say after Christmas, maybe for some people, there is a time that you might want to tighten up your, your diet a little bit, you know? Uh, but if you're going to tighten up your diet, you can't really have a hard workout. You, know, you just can't, but everyone's convinced about it, that they can. Um, reason was, the, the, the definition I always use is this. It's from Percy Henry Winfield. Of course, who, who can forget Percy? <laughs> he said, uh, what you want in a court, what you want as a jury of your peers are reasonable people. You want a reasonable doctor. You want a reasonable coach. And he said this about the he said this about reasonableness, and I think it's genius. He has not the courage of Achilles, the wisdom of Ulysses, or the strength of Hercules, nor has the prophetic vision of a clairvoyant. He will not anticipate folly in all of its forms, but he never puts out consideration the teachings of experience shows such negligence and so will guard against negligence of others when experience shows such negligence to be common. He is a reasonable man, but not a perfect citizen. And I have always thought that that is just genius. He's a reason. Of the, so the person you want on your jury is a reasonable, but not perfect. And I think what happens in our society, you know, did you see Wonder Woman by any chance? I did. Yeah. Attractive girl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not bad, huh? Yeah. Uh, did you notice how she had superpowers? Right, yeah. Yeah, not bad. And she's immortal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're probably not going to date Wonder Woman. And at the same time, women have to expect you're not going to be Superman or Batman. Right? Right. And yet, that is the concept that most young people think. They, they You know, they think that, you know, I've had those periods of time in my life where I was doing it pretty well. You know, my senior year at Utah State, you know, nice as I can say it, I did have the most attractive girl on Utah State's campus as a girlfriend. Uh, that's true. And I did have a 4.0, and I was the MVP of the track team. But I got to tell you, the wheels came off right after, okay? And there are times in your life where you're Wonder Woman and Superman. Right. But that's, that's not who you want. I mean, do you really want – you know, we have that great saying in, uh, in theology, a saint thinks he's a sinner – and a sinner thinks he's a saint. And do we really want a jury of people who think they're saints? Because no, you'll get convicted every time. You want a reasonable person. So I want you to train in a reasonable way that makes you train, what, 185 times a year, maybe? Whatever, whenever 50, 150 times, 50 weeks, three days a week, 250, 50 weeks, five days a week. You know, you follow my point, right? Yeah. I, I'd like you to eat pretty darn well. Of the 21 meals a week that you have, boy, I'd love to see you eat pretty smart, 18 of them, maybe 17, 16. Not, I don't want 18 cheat meals, but I also don't want 21 perfect meals because you're not going to do that either. I want It's reasonable. You know, I'd like you to be a, I'd like you to be a good neighbor, but I don't want you to be that psychopath neighbor who comes over and who sees a leaf on my lawn and, 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 you know, comes over and, Oh, don't, I got you. I raked your lawn for you. You know, and they all have the perfect kids and you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Happy people are reasonable people. As a strength coach, once I came up with standards and the standards basically say this, once you do these standards, you're strong enough. Any problems you're having in the field of play, that's because you're having problems in the field of play, not in the weight room. You're strong enough, mobile enough. You're flexible enough. Now go out there and play. You know, um, reasonable. I, I wanted my daughters to graduate from college. 
If it took him three years, like in Kelly's case, that's great. It took Kelly five. I should check that. Kelly took three. Lindsay, it took five. Hey, they averaged four. I'm pretty happy as a dad, you know? And that to me is reasonableness. Um, so that's the chapter I'd like to write it on. I think that that's really incredible. And to be honest, uh, I don't know why I've never seen it that way or used that word, but that's that's what I've done with a lot of athletes. And that is when they do start seeing more success. Someone who's never maybe worked with a coach before and they're having their first conversation with you and, and they're maybe expecting something along the lines of, you know, you, to your point, 21 meals. They're, they're expecting me to say, uh, yeah, well, your diet sucks right now and it needs to be perfect every day of the week for, you know, the next week. And that's not what I tell them. I tell them, hey, look, I know this is this is all like new stuff. We're getting into uh, some new training. So like, yeah, can you give me uh, 18 meals? Uh, you know, what what can you commit to right now? Um, and that mind shift helps people so much in actually accomplishing their goals as opposed to aiming for perfection. Because it's, it's never never good when you start putting that in your crosshairs. Hey, tell you what I'll do. Um, I, I won't ever write this book. So well, let me just – would you mind if I just sent you a bunch of this stuff and just give it to your audience? Would that be okay? Yeah, I'll definitely uh, link to all of it. No, no. I'm just going to send it to you. Okay. It's not pro- ever been published anyway. Because uh, it's funny as I'm thinking about it. My coach, Ralph Mon had a sign on his desk that said this. and This is a funny quote. Be reasonable. Do it my way. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And then another quote for you before we go too far on this. Earl Nightingale in that great series, Lead the Field, which is on the audio tape that changed my life. Uh, I had a dark night of the soul in the mid-1980s. Uh, very sick from the Middle East. Uh, living in a fold-out bed in a basement. Uh, my car was always broken. The bumper was held on with the weightlifting belt. <laughs> and I listened to Lead the Field. And even though I'd had a lot of success in my life, I needed something to turn my life around. And this is the quote he said that changed my life. And to me, reasonableness is another word for integrity. Integrity to truth, to the evidence, no matter where it leads. Are you ready to discover through experiment and reflection what course of life will fulfill those powers most completely. That's being true to yourself. That's integrity. That's reasonableness. Man, that's integrity. That's reason. Being, uh, that's good stuff. That's it's incredible stuff. I absolutely love it. Yeah. All right, Dan, uh, to be honest, I've learned a ton and I love picking your brain, but I want to be mindful of your time. Um, So can we get to the quick fire questions of the show? Are you ready for them? Oh, I suppose. All right. Yeah. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? Yeah, <laughs> easy. June 1979. I was trying to uh, make uh, win a bet. Uh, so the workout was 30 back squats with 315 pounds. Rest. 30 back squats with 275 pounds. Rest. 30 back squats with 225 pounds. That's... How were you the next, uh, I don't know, two weeks after that one? I was. I <laughs> sat on this little pink incline bench for a long time because I was driving a motorcycle and I couldn't figure out how I could change, you know, the gears are on the foot, Yeah. how I change gears going home. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That sounds brutal. Absolutely brutal. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Uh, raising children. I could agree with that one. I have two young boys myself and one on the way. So I got to tell you, I, I, anything else I've ever done was sissy compared. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, it happened to me one time not too long ago. Uh, my 28 kilo kettlebell. Okay, great. Yeah, so doing... Um... You can do so much with a kettlebell. Any, anything, yeah. But the funny thing you ask is it did happen to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, so so I had to make that decision, and that's what I did. So this isn't this isn't fairyland. This is what I did, yeah. yeah. All right, and then the question of the show, what's the best advice you have for becoming a better human? And this is 100% open-ended. My wife and I have a mission statement. Now, we're an odd family. We have... A, We have a family motto and we have a mission statement. So the family motto is this. 
It's not where you start. It's where you finish. And I got to tell you, man, my daughters hold tight to that. It means so much to them. Um, it does. I'm, I'm shocked sometimes. We'll be in an event and my daughter will lean forward. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. And they'll nod their head. But our family mission statement is something I, I, that we hold very dear. Make a difference. So whenever we make it, so we donate, we have a little foundation, our family foundation, and we donate a fair amount of money every year. Um, but what we're looking for are those companies, uh, those organizations that make a difference. You know, what? how can we give you of our time, treasure, and talents? If if all the money is just going to go into another, you know, another window or another carpet, I don't know if that makes a difference in the world. So we actively, so when my wife and I look at opportunities I have to travel, one of the things that will come up, she'll say, well, Danny, you know, is that going to make a difference? And when I hear that, that's when I usually have absolute clarity in what I'm going to do. Um, people ask me why I I give away most of my training for free. And I, and I say, well, because Dick Notmeyer, Ralph Mon, Bob Lahati, my brothers, they didn't charge me really anything. So I have this debt to give back, and I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference for someone like Dick Notmeyer. Dick Notmeyer made a difference for me. The guy changed my life. Uh, all my education has been paid for because of my, my throwing the discus for. And the foundation of that was Olympic lifting with Dick. I, how can you thank that person enough? You know, I dedicated one of my books to him. And according to his son, he drove around to every person he knew and said, look, he dedicated this to me. And I'm like, man, I, I should have dedicated every book to him. So make a difference is what I tell you people. <laughs> Try to have a prism of, uh, of a worldview of how will this decision make make lives better for others, and and all very often you have great clarity from that. And if you don't mind me asking, when did you um, implement the mission statement and motto into your family? Wow, it would be hard to pull out. Um, we we have it in Christmas cards when the girls are little. So we don't, yeah, we're probably the only uh, Christmas card family ever to have our motto. And <laughs> I think it's awesome. Yeah. And mission statement. And so we put it in there and, and, and the girls are little. So it have to be back into the early 90s. I doubt 89. I doubt that early. Uh, but I could see, but I could see it's probably by 90. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, just curious as a as a father of two young boys, I love that idea. I thought I uh, would uh, just want to know when you started uh, implementing that, you know, and into the family. Yeah, life. yeah. And the nice thing about it is, um, so both of my daughters were were athletes. One went on to Division One, but uh, they'll both tell you that they weren't the best throwers, shot put, discus. No, but by the end they were pretty good. And my daughter Kelly. You know, her career exploded and she tells people, well, it's because I did this, this and this, you know. Um, so I guess, I guess, you know, I was the smallest, I mean, except for Mark Zoker, I was the smallest kid in first grade. Uh, I was 118 pounds in ninth grade. I, I was always behind, but it didn't matter where I started, it mattered where I finished. And, and if and it, by the way, that ties into reasonableness very well, doesn't it, when you think about it? Because when you're working with a young athlete and you say, hold on, you're not going to be in the NFL tomorrow. Let's give me eight, nine years. You know, I just think that's a much more appropriate way of coaching, okay? And teaching and fathering and mothering and all the other ings you can think of. Well, I, I love it. And uh, I'm sure a lot of other people have learned a lot listening to you and uh, this conversation. So where could people learn more if they wanted to dive in more into maybe your books, uh, website, where should they go? Well, my website's danjohn.net. And um, that's probably the best place. Uh, I also have a, uh, a Q&A over at davedraper.com. And you're all welcome to ask me any questions there. I'm always happy, always happy to answer questions. Okay. Well, listen, you, it's been a delight talking to you. I've really, it's, 
thank you for asking uh, questions that aren't just five sets of two and front squats. I really appreciate that more than you know. Yeah, I feel uh, like it's not. Um, people are always surprised when I, I have these kind of conversations, but uh, you know, I feel like I, I you've you've published information like that. And if I just wanted to read about those kind of things, um, I, I could have done that or or could point uh, could point people to that. I, I really like to know who you are, and you know, I think that's way more important about yeah the, the development of. Uh, well, here's the funny thing: I, I see no. Sep- I'm from the Western civilization tradition. There should be no difference between my my intellectual life, my physical life, my competition life, my social, my spiritual life. There should be no separation. I should be – so when we do talk about something as reasonableness, I should be reasonable as a neighbor, as a father, as a husband, as a coach, as a, as a training myself. And people miss that sometimes. Uh, I think it's real hard to be unreasonable in one part of your life and then reasonable in the next one. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, this has been a real delight. I've really appreciated this, okay? Yeah, me too. I appreciate your time, and uh, I'll shoot you an email here on Monday when everything's uh, published. All right. My best to you, okay? Thank you. You too. Thank you. always whine about their best.